Good evening. I'm your host, Arlana Shikongo, and welcome to another episode of Heartbeat. As today is the eve of the United Nations International Youth Day, this episode will look at a subject around youth health, which has been a point of contention over recent months. There have been youth-led protests in regards to reproductive and sexual health issues, as well as a lot of discussion around the country's comprehensive sexu sexuality education program. This amid rising incidents of teen pregnancy in the country. So, joining us today to have a discussion about reproductive and sexual health for the youth, we have doctor and health advocate, Dr. Esperance Luvendau, who does work relating to IUDs, which are intrauterine devices, and other reproductive and sexual health facilities. We'll also be joined by Cynthia Sitali, the Namibia Director of Health for the African Youth and Adolescence Network, and later by a clinical surveillance specialist based in the U.S. who is Namibian, Ndeshi Conte. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and I really look forward to having this discussion around reproductive and sexual health with you all. And I'm sure, as you know, in the context of Namibia, uh, the past, I want to say, 12 months to a year or so, there have, there's been so much going on in the area of reproductive and sexual health, especially as it pertains to the youth. Um, as you know, the, the protests that happened at the beginning of the year, and some of which happened last year, was all youth-led. And then, of course, there was the big controversy when uh, there was discussion around completely eliminating the comprehensive sexuality education program in Namibia to change it to something that was more traditional focused. So um, to get us started, I think let's just get an understanding of what sexual and reproductive <coughs> health is and why that is important. Dr. Luvendau, if you can please uh, get us started on that note. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Arlana. This is an absolute honor. And I always say that because platforms like this is what we really need to get the word out there. And so I commend you and your team. You're doing absolutely phenomenal. Thank so you. in summary, sexual and reproductive health is as simple as it says, sexual being education about sex, right? And everything to do with sex. Mm -hmm. That means the act of sex, the risks involved, how to protect yourself from those risks mm -hmm. and what can come out of it, whether it's pregnancy, whether it's disease and how to manage those. And then, so that's the sexual part, and then the reproductive part covers the act of reproduction, right? So mm -hmm. once you do have coitus, particularly with the penetrative sex, now that is penis, vagina, that would then mean that you have a risk of pregnancy, obviously depending on where exactly in your cycle you have the intercourse or have the coitus, mm -hmm. that would then determine your risk or your chances of falling pregnant. So the reproductive part of it deals with reproduction being the fertilization of sperm sperm ovum, but then also what happens thereafter and how to mitigate those risks or how to handle the consequences that may come from that. Mm -hmm. So sexual and reproductive health just covers that. And the health part of it focuses on disease, particularly disease prevention and how to sure, ensure health holistically when talking about both the sexual and the reproductive components. Thank you, doctor. And I'm happy that you note the holistic approach of the term sexual and reproductive health, because I think sometimes what ends up happening is that people convolute that sentiment with simply meaning we want to talk about sex. And at the end of the day, that's not what it's about. The health aspect really indicates that, you know, this is bigger than just who people are getting in bed with. It's about prevention. Yeah. It's about understanding the risks that come with it and how to take care of yourself in that essence. Exactly. Um, um, so, Ndeshi, I'll pose this question to you, just looking at uh, both the local and regional uh, programs that are available for African youth and teenagers in regards to reproductive and sexual health education. What kind of programs currently exist in the regional context and then, of course, in the local Namibian context? Sorry. Uh, 
I mean, Cynthia, I am so sorry I got that mistaken, but your mic is off. If you could please turn that on for us. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. okay, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. This kind of discussion are very much important, mm -hmm. more especially to we, the youth, uh, out today. That includes all of us. Um, okay, uh, when we talk about local and regional level, Afrian is a network that is represented in more than 21 countries mm -hmm. in Eastern um, and Southern Africa. So Afrian is part of the ISA commitment, it's a commitment that uh, was made by the, um, the government represented by the Ministry of Gender, mm -hmm. Health and Education. So um, we do um, local and regional, we do campaigns such as um, condomized campaign yeah. and also as um, uh, distributing sanitary pads. All right. And um, with the condomized um, program that is running, um, how effective has it been so far in Namibia? Are we seeing that, um, you know, young people are making more of an effort to protect themselves when these programs are happening, be that workshops, uh, workshops or various talks? Are the young people coming out or what does this, you know, showing up for this conversation look like locally? Okay, um, this one is really showing a big improvement because you see when we do a condomized setup or mm -hmm. when we do such kind of activity, you, uh, we, we, we attract a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. You know, we, this is what is happening at the moment. So, which is really a very good thing, uh, I would say. Absolutely. Um, and then that kind of leads me into now thinking about our local more so educational programs, you know, because there are organizations that are doing their independent work when it comes to sexual and reproduct reproductive health and educating the nation on that. But then we do also have our, what what's called the Comprehensive Sexuality Education Program. Now, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think all of us have been in some capacity probably educated in Namibia. So we've taken a sex ed class in some capacity here. Um, but I would like to hear from you, um, doctor, as a medical professional, Cynthia, as somebody who works in this sphere, um, would you say that um, our programs, um, you know, are they comprehensive enough? Do they teach our young people enough and give them the information needed to equip them with making uh, safe decisions when it comes to sexual and reproductive health? Doctor, I'll start with you. The honest answer for that is no, not at all. And that's me being open and honest. I do trust that that's why you have me here, is to have these open and robust discussions. Honestly speaking, no. Mm -hmm. The education that we receive with regards to sexual and reproductive health currently within our education system is not nearly where it should be. Unfortunately, in a lot of areas, in particular regions, talking about sex is still a taboo. Mm -hmm. And I actually, you know, during the contraceptive, the IUD campaign that we were running, we made an effort to actually go into some of the schools and sit in their life, life skill lessons and sit into some of these classes, et cetera. And, you know, it's difficult for someone to be able to talk freely about something when they themselves feel like this is a taboo and I'm not supposed to be talking about this. And this is the reality with a lot of teachers and people mm -hmm. that are supposed to be conveying this information to students, which mm -hmm. then causes a break in communication because number one, already if they don't believe that children should be knowing these things or doing these things, that also limits the extent to which they inform themselves. And when I say inform themselves, when you, it, it's quite alarming to note that there is still a lot of misconceptions being taught and going around, even within our school systems. And you ask people, where did you get this? And they'll say, no, but my teacher in life skills or my biology teacher told me this. Mm. And this is alarming because these are people that, because it's, it's not possible, unfortunately, to have a doctor at every single one of these sessions to teach these things in detail. So we rely on these teachers to be able to convey that information. And unfortunately, that gap 
is quite huge. And that's one of the biggest problems we have because we've had patients at the hospital tell you, I have never heard of a condom. Mm. And this is a learner. This is a grade 10, grade 12 pupil. And you ask yourself, okay, but how is that possible? Because you're a student, yes. You go to school, yes. Do you have this lesson and this lesson? Yes. So what are you taught? Some of them will say during that class, the teacher just passes by mm -hmm. or those lessons are normally free periods whereby we can just sort of sit and do whatever it is we, we want to do. We don't get taught about these things. And one of the things that I always say is whether we like it or not, children are having sex. Before I left the North about last month or a month and a half ago, I had a patient, a 13-year-old, this is my second 13-year-old who is getting a C-section mm. because she was pregnant. So she was she was so tiny that her body literally couldn't accommodate, her pelvic region couldn't accommodate her fetus. So we had to do a C-section. And you ask yourself, and I had a conversation with this 13-year-old, and I asked her, okay, but did you use a condom? She says, no. Why not? I was never told about condoms. Mm. And that made me very emotional because it meant that we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So in terms of comprehensive sex ed, that I would give us as a country, not the country, I'll give us as a nation less than 50% from my side. Oh, wow. Uh, Cynthia, yeah. I, would, I would like to hear your, your perspective on, on that same question. Is our um, comprehensive sexual education pro program, is it comprehensive enough? Um, well, I would say... In Namibia, um, it does, we, Namibia does not have CSE curriculum, you mm. see, or, or the subject. So the CSE content, it's built into our life skill, you know. It's built into our life skill curriculum. So our program is called uh, Life Skill Based Health Education. Mm. So our curriculum is very comprehensive and covers all the aspects of um, uh, sexual and reproductive health. And, and uh, sexual reproductive health and rights as well as social development skills for healthy decision making. Mm. So I would say that, um, as a uh, doctor has said, um, this um, CS itself, uh, when we go in school, it's uh, called life skill, based healthy mm. education. So it covers all such things, you see? Mm. And we more focus more, especially in outside, you see? Okay. So um, I would say that the information is Given, it's been given to the, our life school teachers, been given outside the schools. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes from the very 50, I would say 60 percent of our, uh, let me say, of our kids, they are aware of what is happening, what what CSE is, mm -hmm. what comprehension is. So, yeah. Yeah. So then if I'm understanding correctly, that means that um, the content is within the curriculum. It's there, but it seems to be that there is a breakdown in the knowledge being passed on to the young people, which would, to me, if I'm assessing that situation, indicates and speaks to the conservative nature, perhaps, of the people who should be teaching these subjects, um, which, I mean, uh, Dr. Dr. Luvendau, you, you, you hinted to this, um, that, you know, it's such a taboo subject almost still in most of our cultures and in most of our yeah. societies to speak about sex openly. So there's a breakdown of that knowledge coming from the people who should be teaching the kids and the kids then absorbing that information. Um, then what yeah. I'm curious about is if we were to say in an ideal world, everything was working perfectly, the curriculum was there and um, the information was being passed down to the young people, what specifically would a suitable and comprehensive sexual education program in Namibia look like? What would we be teaching the kids and what would we be making sure that they are aware of? Doctor, I'll start with you. Okay, so I would divide that if if I had, so to speak, any right with, with, with regards to designing this curriculum. I would ultimately divide that into talking about the science of it, so the biology, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding what is sex, number one, because you still have a lot of young people asking, what is sex? Is oral sex sex? Does mm -hmm. it count as sex? 
is sex only when the penis goes into the vagina? Is sex when penis goes into the anus? What is sex? So firstly, starting off with that, number one, in terms of definition, so that people can understand, all right? Once they have that basic understanding of, like, like we broke it down now, what is sexual and reproductive health? Mm. Once you get that definition out of the way, immediately then we will go into detail and start discussing each of these. So when we talk about coitus, right, and we talk about the act of sexual penetration, what happens there? For example, during the campaign where, we, where I was talking about vaginal discharge, and I had this running for quite a few months, mm. I remember that somebody asked me, and they said, well, can somebody get pregnant if, they, if the man doesn't ejaculate? All right. And those are important questions because those are things that should be dealt with ideally during these classes. Mm. So it's not just saying, OK, this is sex, penis, vagina. And I've seen it even within our textbooks that sex is just portrayed as that. But that's not true. That is coitus. Mm. Yes. But oral sex is also sex. Can you get STDs from that? Yes, you can. So these are important things that we need to talk about. And our literature needs to become more comprehensive because sex is not just penis, vagina. That's not true. All right. So apart from the definitions, talking about these individual concepts, breaking them down and then answering very important the questions that young people have. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, everybody wants to giggle when you talk about sex, but the people that are actually having sex within the classroom are listening and they're taking this information in mm. and to them they're saying okay only this is sex so if sex is just penis vagina that means then that i can't get the std from doing this and this mm. so let me just go ahead and do this as long as i'm not having penetrative sex right and then i would also include the part of talking about the myths and culture now, that's very important because it sounds very simple, but somebody said to me when I was running the vaginal discharge, you know, campaign initiative that I started, and they said, as far as you're so comfortable with saying the word penis and vagina, and I said, yes, because it's a penis and it's a vagina. There's nothing special about it. We all have these things. And the sooner we start talking, because there are men and women that are suffering and struggling with STDs, repeated STDs and all these things, and they don't know how to manage them and how to seek for help because of that cultural belief mm. that teaches us, like we said, that this is a taboo and we can't talk about these things. So I would make it holistic, start with the definitions, manage each of or discuss each of the concepts under it allow for questions and then also just talk about the myths and the cultural things that are placed on top of this topic mm. i would make it comprehensive in that manner absolutely um and then cynthia i'd love to hear from you as well um you pointed out that you know the work that you do with afian is outside of schools these are independent programs is there anything specific specific in the programming that is offered by afian that you think should be included in the um life skills health um section of our comprehensive sexual education in schools um Yes, well, if, if we were to offer, then we would offer topics uh, that could cover all the development, the elements of development for young people, mm. um, which includes the physical, uh, emotional, social, and skills required to make for, for the young people to make, a, 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 for themselves to make appropriate decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's in fact function in their you know, health matters, you see, um, is, um, is, uh, as I said, that we focus more outside the school, mm -hmm. but then in schools we can give that help also. That these these are the things. For example, uh, the doctor said about the cultural norms. Yeah, these are the main effects that are really happening. Kids are uh, they are the cultural norms, the religious. You know, these are the things which are really um, causing, or I would say, these are the things that uh, hinder. Yeah, like compressive sexuality in schools, you see. So, um, if if these things were to be taught in schools, if they were, they were to be, you no, know, um, the, the life school teacher were open in schools, men as were taught about these things, like no, these things are happening because mm. they are really happening. You know? So, I, I think, yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And I mean, um, you know, between the three of us and our audience watching, it's pretty easy for us to say, OK, um, you know, this should be added and that should be added. And I'm sure that in, in other rooms where people are having these discussions, these same ideas keep coming up and they probably have for many years. But what I'm curious about now, um, and hopefully, Doctor, your experience working in this area during a COVID pandemic can speak to this as well. Has the attention that has been put on the pandemic hindered the steps that we have been taking towards um, making our sexual education programming in the country stronger and more accessible to young people? Has the pandemic hindered that? Have we kind of reached some sort of blockage because we're focusing our energy on, on everything but that right now? Mm. Honestly, not, because, look, what we try and achieve at all times, and I believe that with this particular point, I speak for healthcare workers, policymakers within the healthcare sector, et cetera, the whole team, mm -hmm. what we're trying to achieve is holistic healthcare. And when I say holistic healthcare, that means one or focusing on the one aspect does not then mean that it takes away attention from one, but we can focus on COVID and we can focus on sexual and reproductive health and we can focus on TB, we can focus on HIV, we can focus on all these things. And the reasons we're able to do that is because we have put in place or structures have been put into place that ensure that you have your managing, so to speak, level of people that still ensure that whether it be in the obstetrics and gynecology department, whether it be in the pediatric department or whatever case it is, that their targets are still being met. Mm. So irrespective of what is happening with COVID, we still, for example, have regular maternal mortality meetings taking place in our various hospitals in the obstetrics and gynecology department because irrespective of COVID, we still need to be held accountable for what is happening, the amount of deaths, the teenage pregnancies and all these things. So the one is not does not make the other one invalid or whatever the case is. The work is still very much there. I think in terms of the public, maybe it may seem like the focus has been taken away mm. because a lot of the so to speak, initiatives that are happening in the public eye have focused on COVID in terms of vaccinations. And every second topic on Clubhouse is vaccinations and this and this and this. But on the ground, grassroots level, in terms of healthcare workers, in terms of policymakers and all these things, this is still very much a focus as is everything else that is taking place. So no, it has not taken away from the efforts that have been made at all. We ran the IUD campaign and continue to run it while we were doing, while we were at the second wave of COVID. Mm. And although at that particular point in time when we thought to expand the IUD campaign to the rest of the Oshikoto region, there was a little bit of, so to speak, comments to say, okay, but you know, can we just, and I said, no, but this is still an issue because yes, COVID is taking place, but that young girl in the village still fell pregnant last night or whatever the case is, because we need to keep going. Yes, COVID is an issue right now, but it's not supposed to take away from our efforts at all because unfortunately, as a healthcare worker, I need to keep in mind that the world continues. So people with diabetes, people with hypertension, people with HIV, mm -hmm. these things are still happening whether or not we are actively involved in COVID. Absolutely. And doctor, I'm happy that you are able to explain that when it comes to health matters, things can exist simultaneously. Um, I asked that question because one of the comments that we got um, as we were advertising the show was, you know, we have other important things happening. Why do you guys want to talk about sex? <laughs> So um, I think it's it's good to get that perspective that just because there yeah. are other health issues that the nation has to yeah. deal with on a priority level doesn't mean yeah. that, you know, the things happening in the sphere of sexual and reproductive health have completely been put aside. We still have to yeah. focus on it because these are still things that are affecting our nation. Okay. 
Um, and then just exactly. kind of rounding up on the CSE conversation, I'd like to hear from both of you, and I'll start with Cynthia. Um, what do you think would be at stake if CSE is not implemented in the country? Like, uh, what would be the effect of not having a comprehensive sexuality education program? Well, um, if CSE is not implemented in the country, young people will continue to fall pregnant. You know, that's one thing. Young people continue to fall pregnant. We have, uh, we'll see, we'll continue to see uh, a lot of high rate of new infections. Mm. We'll continue to see yeah. uh, unsafe abortion. We'll continue to see um, high rate of gender-based violence. And yeah. yeah, you know, those things that will increase, the things that we are seeing, it, and, and the, when, when CSE is being implemented, you see the, uh, um, the rate of, when you say teenage pregnancy, gender-based violence, is low. Mm. But if it's not implemented, we will continue to see these things each and every day. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Lubendal? Agreed. I definitely agree with what Cynthia said. It is really just straightforward, straight to the point. Unless we get serious with this, this topic, this theme, and incorporating it within our education systems, we will unfortunately continue to see this, these increased rates in teenage pregnancies. And mind you, you know, apart from just an increased rate in teenage pregnancies and an increased HIV you know, infection and STDs and all these things, what people don't understand is these things have a lifelong effect. Mm. So I think a lot of people think to themselves, okay, a teenager fell pregnant. It's not the end of the world, this branch. She's still, yes, it's not the end of the world. But understand something, all right? For example, a 13-year-old gets pregnant, okay? And like I said before, probably their pelvis, all right, cannot accommodate the, 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 the delivery of the fetus. And because of that, we end up doing a C-section, right? Which means we have to literally operate. That is an operation. Right, so automatically you're putting this 13 year old at risk, at, at operative risk, right? So all of these operative complications automatically fall on this child. Now remember that when you have an operation, you also have, you can have complications, right? You can have things like adhesions forming. And these things all contribute such that ultimately it could, number one, lead to difficulty having, you know, a certain number of kids at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you understand, because then it limits the amount of children that she can have long term, whatever the case is. And it can also lead to, you know, immediate effects, consequences, such as maternal mortality. This is a child. They can literally die on the table. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the consequences. But then when you talk about STDs, I always like talking about this because I feel that a lot of young people are not in, well informed about this. So having sex and getting an STD is not as simple as coming to Esperance and she gives you an injection and then she gives you two other tablets and you're treated and it's okay. And then three months later, you get the same infection. You come back to Esperance, she gives you the same thing. Mm. Because what you need to understand is some of these infections, for example, things like your HPV, have things attached to them. So it increases your risk of getting cancer, cervical cancer, and all these things. So it's important to understand that if we don't deal with, like you're saying now, this comprehensive sexual education, there's so many consequences that we as a nation have to deal with long term. Mm. And that's something that we don't talk about often enough. Right. And also in terms of the earlier somebody starts having sex, that's one of the risk factors when you talk about things like your survival cancer and HPV and all these things. And those are things that people also don't talk about because they say, well, my body, my choice. Yes. But ideally, when you're 13 years old and you're having sex, the negative aspects are more than the positives, all right? And it's our responsibility to be open about those things. So I feel like there's so many consequences and people need to start having these discussions. Otherwise, the consequences are disastrous. Mm, absolutely. And that really speaks to uh, the intersectionality of um, sexual and reproductive health issues into your, our normal existence as human beings. At the, at, the, at the core of it, human beings are sexual by nature. Um, so it would make sense that, you know, at some point in your life, you start becoming sexual and you should be um, um, you should have the resources to know what you're getting into and how to take care of yourself. Yeah. 
But uh, just to play a little bit of devil's advocate, uh, just looking at the more um, conservative approach to uh, talking about sex, at what point do we say this information is far too much for a 13-year-old to know or a 12, 11-year-old to know. Uh, when we think about how to educate children mm. on, on sexual matters, how do we go about it? And perhaps, Cynthia, you can talk, you can speak to this because I'm sure um, the programming at AFRIAN is, is, you know, it, 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 it goes along different ages. There are teenagers, there are um, younger children, adolescents that are, you know, closer to their teens and adulthood. So what is the approach there when it comes to deciding what information to give to which age demographic? Um, well, we do, we do have a uh, um, age range mm -hmm. whereby uh, from this age, from today to this age, let me say from uh, 13, as we said, uh, doctor said 13, they are already falling pregnant. Mm -hmm. So from uh, 13, um, let me say from 13 to 15, they do have their own, uh, you know, um, education mm -hmm. about comprehensive sexuality education. And then from 16, up to 35 now you you go up to there we we do teach these people because these are in and most of them you find them out of school mm -hmm. so we educate them more about uh comprehensive sexuality education srhr so that they do have more information uh, about all of these things um yeah all right. Um, and uh, dr Lubendau, what's your approach as you mentioned you you've had two patients so far 13 year old yeah. young girls, you know? Um, so we know that in, in early teens, people are already becoming sexually active. So what is the best approach to take when thinking about the various age demographics and how to educate them on um, sexuality issues? Okay, let me be a little bit controversial on this point. Honestly speaking, firstly, let me start by saying that yes, the youngest, pregnant patient that I have had as a 13 year old. That's true. But that is not the youngest that I have seen sexually active. Mm. The youngest that I've seen sexually active is a boy of eight years old with a girl of six years old. Oh, wow. Okay. Now that is very important because I read some research that actually shows that from the age, all right, of six, you should be educating your children already from home on what this is. Because, and at first I read it and I said to myself, my six-year-old, no, I would never do that. But what you need to understand is that unfortunately, when we don't educate and comprehensive sexual education starts at home, it doesn't start at school. And unfortunately, the reality is if we don't educate our children, somebody else will educate them. And the bad thing is that when they get educated out there, it's often misguided information. And the problem is that, especially in a school setting, they're not just learning from the teacher, mm. they're learning from their friends. And these friends come from different backgrounds and different home settings. Some of them, unfortunately, let me be a little bit you know, blatantly honest, some of them come from homes whereby they've seen these things taking place. Mm. And so they then start informing your children and your children's children, et cetera. So whether we are cultural or not, I do not believe that 13 is the time to start educating our children. I believe that already, you know, as young as I remember when I was, I don't remember how old I was, but I was less than 10. Mm. And I remember I asked my brother, I think we were watching Bold and the Beautiful, and they said something about virginity. And I asked my brother and I said, what is a virgin? Mm. And he always reminds me about that today. And I said, what is a virgin? Now it's less than 10. Okay. And a lot of the times when we ask these questions, there's this, everybody cringes and everybody, but if your child asks you, mommy, what is a penis? You tell them, mm. you understand. Even if you say that, okay, fine. You know, a penis is the genitals of a man. You are a girl. That is why you have this. This is called a vulva. This is a vagina. And you shouldn't be letting 
uh, penis into your, and it sounds simple and it sounds silly, but it's not because this is part of the reason why also we have so many of these things, you know, in terms of abuse and all these things going on, because a lot of the times when we don't educate our children also, a lot of little children will tell you, and I've had a lot of patients like that will tell you, but uncle told me that it was okay mm. because the child doesn't know any better because mommy didn't want to tell her what a vagina is and what a penis is and that that's not supposed to go in there. And so if uncle, you know, tries to convince me and, and I will say, okay, you know, it's uncle loves me or whatever the case is. And these are disturbing things. Yes, but we need to start talking about them. Mm. So unfortunately, I don't think that 13 is the right age. I feel that look, the younger, the better. Start having the conversations as early as six years old. This is what this is. This is what this is. This shouldn't be happening at this age because it's dangerous or whatever the case is. Mm. And then you inform them. So when they get information out there, they come to you and they say, mommy, I heard this or daddy, I heard this. Is this true? And you have those open conversations because 90% of the beliefs that we have as adults were built way before we even turned 15 years old. Absolutely. That's my, that's my input. Yeah, definitely going to be a very controversial perspective, <laughs> but you do make very relevant points about educating kids so that they know right from wrong in the event that they are approached in a way that is sexual. Rather have them know that this isn't yeah. supposed to be happening than have them, you know, forced into yeah. a, a difficult or tricky situation. Um, I'm going to take yeah. some of our audience questions. We have some comments um, that I think would be good to look into before we close off the show. We have a comment here from Pancho Mulongeni who says, certain sectors say the CSE will teach children about homosexuality and make learners gay and lesbian. Any comment from the panelists? I can read that one again if, if you would like me to. Unless someone's ready. Yes, to please, on please read that again. <laughs> okay. um, Pancho Mulongeni says, certain sectors say the CSE will teach children yes. about homosexuality and make learners gay and lesbian. Any comment from the panelists? So Interesting we... question. Yeah, go know. ahead, doctor. Interesting question. I think it's a, it's a little bit of a controversial one. We'll make them gay. It's... It's an interesting question. I, I don't, my, my straight answer would be no, because like I said, the ultimate look, there are a lot of things that can really be brought up from this discussion, this mm -hmm. topic. There are a lot of, okay, but, okay, but. Mm -hmm. And what I always like to say is that with things like this, you always need to weigh it. When we as the healthcare sector are about to introduce a drug, into the pharmacy system or whatever the case is, we look at the pros and the cons, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is how we determine whether or not a drug is suitable and whether it falls into A, B, C, or D or whatever, all right, based on whether the advantages are more than the disadvantages. And when we talk about comprehensive and sexual education, I really just feel that the advantages are way more than the disadvantages. In terms of making someone gay and lesbian, I'm, I'm not going to, touch on that particular phrase, but I feel that the, the, the advantages and the positives from having this comprehensive sexual education outweigh the disadvantages by far. And so I would say no to that. <laughs> um, okay, actually, b before Cynthia, uh, let, me pose it, let me pose it a bit differently. A w one that I think okay. we hear maybe a bit more commonly, commonly than the, you know, it'll make them gay question is, if yeah. we expose our children to this information from an early age, will it not make them m more likely to become sexually active at an early age? Thoughts on that? Okay, one? so, yeah, so my answer with that is always, well, not talking to them about it. My answer to that is a question. Mm. So if you don't talk to them about it, does that mean they're not going to be sexually active? I don't think so. <laughs> if we don't, if we don't talk, I, I tell this to people all the time. I say, look, if a child is going to be sexually active, whether you like it or not, 
I would rather my child be safe and be informed mm. because the majority of the time when your children start having sex, they don't even tell you, mm. right? They're not, they're not telling you. They're, they're not going to come to you and say majority of the time, not all the time. Some households do have that open door policy, but a lot of the times, particularly within this African culture, when people become sexually active, they don't go running to their mom or their dad. So my answer to that is a question. Will not educating them stop them from being sexually active and will not educating them mean that then they're not going to be sexually active because it's it's a two-way thing you mm -hmm. can think of it and say okay if i educate too much will they become sexually active but then the other side of it is what if i don't educate them and they become sexually active for me i would prefer i educate them and what they decide to do is then up to them at least i know that you are safe and i've given you the information that you need to make responsible decisions Absolutely. Um, and then one more question. We're coming towards the end of the show, so I just want to put in some of the, the, the audience's questions. Um, but we have Manzer Peter asking, um, Doctor, help our youth to tell the nation about the advantages of the patch or patches, the new contraception that stop them to lose their youth while they are in school. Okay, so this question is phrased a little bit complicatedly, so let me try to break that down. Uh, Manza Peter is asking the doctor to talk about um, the advantages of the patch, the form of contraception, um, that stop them to lose their youth while they are in school. The second part of that question, I'm not quite understanding, but um, I think the, the viewer just wants to get a little bit of information out there about the advantages of uh, the patch as a form of contraception. Okay. So I think I actually do understand what, what, what the person is saying. It's something that I spoke about quite a lot in terms of not necessarily phrasing it that way, but when we were promoting the IUD contraceptive, mm -hmm. one of the things that we were telling them, because people kept asking, is this the hormonal or the non-hormonal one? Okay. Now, let me summarize it like this. When it comes to contraceptives, they're divided into various categories, right? Contraceptions can be the barrier method, barrier method being condoms, all right, mm -hmm. which can be your male condom, it can be your female condom, all right, those are some of your barrier methods. Then you can have your hormonal methods, those hormonal methods can be the pill, right, it mm -hmm. can be your IUD, which can be hormonal, they can be things like your patch, they can be all these things, the implant, all of those are your hormonal methods, mm -hmm. right? And then there are your non-hormonal methods, and then there are your rhythm methods, such as knowing your, your schedule, right? Your calendar and saying, okay, at around day 14 to whatever, I'm likely to ovulate, so I need to avoid sex, peri-ovulatory, and those type of things, or just checking your basal body temperature, right? Because when you're ovulating, generally your temperature increases by about 0 0.5, mm -hmm. right? So those are the different sort of categories of contraception, contraceptive methods now. One of the things that we were saying when we were promoting the IUD contraceptive that we were inserting in the North is that this is a non-hormonal contraceptive, which is very important. Because of the fact that it's non-hormonal, this means that you don't get the side effects of the hormones, okay. okay? Which is obviously good because we know that some of the side effects of your hormones is things like weight gain and acne and depression and increased risk of thromboembolism and all these things. Mm -hmm. So ideally what we were saying is that it's safer because yes, we're implanting something, it feels invasive, but because it doesn't have hormones, then you don't get those side effects, mm -hmm. all right? And so I think that's what they were saying, that they were saying sort of to protect you or your childhood or whatever the case is in terms of avoiding all of those side effects. You can still be a child, mm. okay? So ideally, the implant is, or the patch and, and all these things are not at the top of my list. If you follow me on any of my social media platforms, you will see that I like to advocate for your non-hormonal methods first mm. because I know the side effects of these hormones. I've seen the side effects of these hormones face-to-face -face, and I know that it's not ideal, especially for a young person. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to use something that has hormones in it, like the patch and all these things, then you want to talk about individuals. So not generalizing the population and say, okay, you must get the patch or whatever the case is, but you want to talk about the individuals and say, all right, what are your risk factors? Because for every individual, before I start them on anything with hormones, I need to understand 
do they have this? Do they have that? Do they have liver problems? Do they have migraines? Are they 35 years old and above? Do they mm -hmm. smoke? All these things. So with things that contain hormones, I don't directly advocate for them by saying, go get yourself a patch. No, but I do advocate and say that, look, the, the, the advantage of it is that it's there and you don't constantly need to be worrying about it like a pill. Because remember with the pill, you have to remember to take something every single day. Mm. So at the very bottom of my list when it comes to contraceptives is the pill. Honestly speaking, I don't even know why we still have the pill in today's age because just the stress, especially imagine a young person that is still in school, still trying to sort of get their life together, a 15, 16, 18 year old, and you're telling them to remember to take a pill every single day, mm. not to mention the hormonal side effects. So the pill is at the bottom of my list. Things like the patch and the injection that don't require you to do this every single day is probably why I would tell this person listening to say, and everybody else to say, okay, fine, try and go for methods that don't require you to remember to do something every single day. And that's okay. once again, so we'd put the pill right at the bottom for me personally. This is not, this is a disclaimer, not according to the Ministry of Health or whatever. This is me. This is my reasoning and logic when it comes to health care. The Absolutely. pill would be at the bottom, particularly with young people. Your injections would be next from the bottom because you still have to take them every two months or every three months. Yeah. And then you get your things like your patches and your IUDs at the top there somewhere because the duration of which you, you have to take these things prolongs as you move up the ladder. So the patches yeah. is definitely not a bad option. Absolutely. And thank you for that, doctor. That actually makes me think that we need to have um, a deeper conversation about the various yeah. forms of contraception and how to make considerations yeah. about what works for you. Um, unfortunately, yeah. though, this is all the time that we have for tonight's show. <laughs> So thank you so much, Dr. Luvendau. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for representing AFRIAN tonight and for having this discussion with us. Um, I look forward to having this similar yeah. topic more in depth in the future. And to our yeah. audience, we always appreciate the audience participation. Please keep the questions coming. We always want to have experts here that can answer and advise on your concerns and queries. And I hope that you tune in again next week for another riveting conversation on Heartbeat. As for us from the studio, that's all for the night. I'm Arlana Shikongo. Goodbye.